you're in, you're in for a story. You're in for a story, okay? Because this is the most terrifying and probably most important piece of performance art that I've ever seen. It's not clear whether the performance stopped because it was over or it actually stopped because the audience had to intervene and force it to end. There's so many important and interesting things to like learn from this artist because she is... She willingly subjected herself to probably the most terrifying thing I could ever possibly imagine. And that's not an exaggeration. I'm not exaggerating. I'm not being dramatic. You'll see. You'll see. The most powerful art pieces reveal something about ourselves that we don't necessarily want to see. Sometimes things that can be very, very deeply buried. The dark side of human nature that contradicts our ideas of how we actually are, that we are civilized that we're kind and nonviolent, that we're sophisticated and moral. This revealed a part of us and a part of the people that were there that we usually try to keep buried really, really deep. How easy it is to lose your humanity when you're both given permission to and then are able to see somebody else as less than human, to objectify them or to dehumanize them with no consequences. Not only does this demonstrate how we act when there are no social consequences or any personal accountability, but also tests the limits between the relationship between the performer and the audience. And so it might actually help understanding a little bit too of why internet culture is the way it is. This is the story of Marina Abramovich and her final performance of what she called her rhythm series. It's called Rhythm Zero. Rhythm Zero puts the viewers in a very uncomfortable position where they're given the power to decide whether someone lives or dies and can assert or basically reject the value of Marina's very existence. So let's go. Now, let's go back in time. I'm not interested in dying, but I'm interested in how far you can push the energy of the human body, how far you can go. Marina is a Serbian conceptual and performance artist. But my explanation of performance is very simple. Performance is mental and physical construction that performer make in a specific time, in a space, in the front of audience, and then energy dialogue happen. The audience and the performer make the piece together. And the difference between performance and theater is huge. In the theater, the knife is not a knife and the blood is just ketchup. In the performance, the blood is the material. Artist. She was born in 1946, as has been called the grandmother of performance art. Now, that name doesn't really give you the right impression of her work, I'm gonna be honest. Okay, I would hardly call it grandmotherly. It's powerful and it's intense and brutal and literally deadly. So, not so grandmotherly. In her words, her goal with this series was to focus on confronting pain, blood, and the physical limits of her body. So she was raised by her grandparents until she was six, and her grandmother was strictly, deeply religious. Marina would spend the majority of her young childhood in church or watching and following along with her grandmother's religious rituals. So every morning, she would light candles, the priest would be like a regular guest in the home. By the time Marina was six, she moved back in with her parents, and at the same time, her mother gave birth to her younger brother. Her parents enrolled Marina in French and English lessons and also would take her to piano lessons. However, she took an interest in art really, really young. She loved painting and drawing and coloring. And that's like me, that's how I was. I love painting, coloring, all that. Like, that's like my thing. I'm an artist too, so I get it. I was also tried piano lessons when I was little and <laughs> didn't go well. That's a story. It did not go well. Now, her mother, like her grandmother, was extremely devoutly religious, almost to a fault. And I grew up with an extremely strict and devout mother as well, so I can kind of relate to that a little bit with how difficult it is to live with a very, very strict parent. But basically, she struggled with her mom's control a lot, and her mom would also use, like, it wasn't just strictness, it was like rigid control, and she would use shame as a weapon to kind of keep Marina in line with whatever she felt was needed of her or necessary or required of her as her daughter. So, so the implementation of this control was not very nice or kind or guiding at all. She, her mother was physically abusive as well as being emotionally abusive. She would beat her young daughter for supposedly showing off, which is disgusting and pathetic. Marina describes what life was like with her mother in an in interview. Her father was around, but he was really reactive and I don't necessarily think he was very present, but either way, 
She does describe one memory she has of her father smashing 12 champagne glasses and then leaving the home. And she says that was one of the most terrible moments of her childhood. She also said in this interview that her parents' marriage was quite terrible in general. So they had conflicts of their own along with the conflicts with their daughter and her brother. She said, and this is a quote, mother took complete military style control of me and my brother. I was not allowed to leave the house after 10 o'clock at night until I was 29 years old. All the performances in Yugoslavia I did before 10 o'clock in the evening because I had to be home then. It's completely insane, but the cutting myself, whipping myself, burning myself, and almost losing my life in the fire star, everything was done before 10 in the evening. She began her rhythm series in 1973, and each installment could be its own video, to be honest, because they're all totally wild, <laughs> but I want to focus on one for this, and that was her most intense, the final performance of the series. It's called Rhythm Zero. The performance was held in the Galleria Studio Mora in Naples. It started at 8 p.m. sharp. Once you walked inside, you could look to one of the gallery walls where there would read a label, and it said, I am the object. I take full responsibility. There was a long table with 72 objects that Marina had spread out on top of it, and then there was another sign posted next to the objects which read the instructions. The instructions stated, there are 72 objects on the table that one can use on me as desired. I am the object. During this period, I take full responsibility. The duration is six hours from 8 p.m. until 2 a.m. Marina's performance would change the roles between performer and audience, changing her individual show into a collective experience that would offer a really important but harrowing message. And there is a young girl, age 23, standing in the middle of the space. I'm going to make the piece to see how far public can go if the artist himself doesn't do anything. Marina stood completely still as the people looked over the seemingly illogical assortment of items on the table and then to her, standing unmoving in the middle of it all. She had assumed a fully passive role, no less passive than any one of the objects. The 72 objects were arranged ritualistically. The table appeared as an altar piece. Each object on the altar represented either pain or pleasure, brutality or kindness. Among them was a feather, a rose, some honey, some olive oil, bread, red and white paint, a Polaroid camera, a pen and paper, some wine, and a bandage. And then all of their opposites, if you will, which included a pair of scissors, a needle, a kitchen knife, a scalpel, a hammer and nails, a saw, the bone of a lamb, a whip, a box filled with razor blades, some chains, and lastly, a gun with a single bullet. This was reminiscent of her interest in Russian roulette. So yeah. This is either extremely ballsy or absolutely batshit crazy, and honestly, I'd say both. It's probably both. Bam. <laughs> okay. In a room surrounded by people she'd never met, she completely dehumanized herself, assumed the role of an object or the objectified, and then gave them permission to hurt, violate, or murder her whatever they wanted. You can use everything on the table on me. I'm taking all responsibility, even killing me. And the time is six hours. No rules. If she died that night, she died that night. And she went into it knowing that. She put her body, her worth, the value of her life in the hands of a group of strangers to do whatever they decided she deserved. I want to know what is the public about and how, how, what they're going to do in this kind of situation. The performance began really tamely. The group was really hesitant, obviously, as you would be, and they looked to each other for guidance on like what to do. With caution, someone turned her around in a circle and another person raised her arm into the air. Someone else touched her somewhat inappropriately. Yes, already. Nice guys. Others looked through the objects that were presented to them that they now realized were their tools. The objects themselves pose no threat. It's only through the use of this object by the audience that any of them would pose a threat to Marina's life. And in the beginning, nothing really happened. Public would come, they would play with me, they would give me a rose, they would kiss me, look at me, and then... After three hours, she had very degrading words painted on her skin. After this point, each action was more dangerous, more violating, 
more risky than the last. Whatever came before it, the next would escalate. All her clothes had been cut off with scissors and razor blades. They took scissors, they cut my clothes, they put uh, rose pins into my body. Marina remained completely passive. It was almost like because with each action that they took, she stayed in this objectified state and this passive state, like no matter what they did, she didn't react. So the more times that she remained passive and didn't say anything, the more they were pushing it. Every, so every single time pushed the boundaries more and more and got more violent and more terrifying. <laughs> Things escalated very, very rapidly. The women will tell the men what to do. They carry me around and put on the table and put a knife between my legs. It probably became more and more wild. They cut uh, my neck and drink my blood. They carry me around. Not all audience members were behaving that way, though. There were some that would try to intervene or try to protect her, and there was another one that stayed at her side and would wipe away her tears. They stuck rose thorns into her stomach. They cut her skin all over with razor blades. One person took a kitchen knife to her neck, slit her throat, and drank her blood. What the fuck? Yeah, I hate that that person's walking around right now. I hope they're not. I hope they're not, but I feel like they probably are. She said, what I learned was, if you leave it up to the audience, they can kill you. I felt really violated. As the realization began that there was no limit to their actions, the piece became absolutely brutal and horrendously violent. She was humiliated in every imaginable way, and yet, you know, likely when they were walking in, not a single one of those people would have ever considered using a gun to kill the performer. But within six hours, someone thrust the now loaded gun right up to her temple and wrapped her own fingers around the trigger. She remained motionless with the gun to her head and her own finger on the trigger. That's commitment. That's seriously, she's, she was committed to her work for sure. It was only at that point in time with the loaded gun pressed against her head that people put a stop to it. And somebody took the pistol and put the bullet and put it against my temple. And another person take the pistol and they start fight. So basically, the subgroups that had formed in the audience, you know, the protective group versus the majority, which was the experimenting group, I guess you would say, the protective group eventually stepped in at this point and made them stop. Her commitment to the piece was completely unfaltering, though. She would resist nothing. If she got murdered, that was it. She got murdered. She, she was not going to resist. She would have shot herself in the head had they pulled her finger on that trigger. And after six hours was finished, I uh, start walking. I uh, start moving. I start being myself because I was there like a puppet just for them. And that moment, everybody ran away. People could not actually uh, confront with, my, with me as, as a person. I was a mess. I was half naked, I was full of blood, and tears was running in my face. And everybody escaped. They just ran away. They could not confront myself with myself as a normal human being. As soon as the performance was over, the audience fled the scene immediately. They ran like they were being chased by Godzilla, okay? All she did was walk towards them. The same woman who they had painted, cut, stabbed, assaulted, humiliated, drank her blood, and tried to kill. All she did was walk toward them and signal the end of the performance and basically reassume her humanity to them, and they ran away. No one looked her in the eye. No one confronted her. They did everything they could to avoid any kind of confrontation. Not even the ones who, mere hours earlier, essayed her, drank her blood, and held a loaded gun to her temple. Not even they looked her in the eyes. They ran away too, which is so interesting and awful, but interesting, like. And then what happened is I went to the hotel. It was at two in the morning and uh, I looked myself in the mirror and I had a piece of gray hair. See, at the time, Back in the 70s, performance artists were pretty highly stigmatized as being attention-seeking, sensationalist, masochist, or exhibitionistic. Marina's piece was directly in response to this, because by leaving the performance entirely up to the audience, Marina made the viewers responsible for the piece and not the artist. See, had the group come in and decided they were going to just be kind, they could have painted her, painted the walls, maybe shared 
broke bread, drank wine, written letters, whatever. There were all of those items were also there. They had plenty of things to do, and yet, how did it turn out? She almost died. So, she faced ridicule for this, though, a lot. I mean, it was the 70s, so it was, like, a little bit expected, but there was a Serbian publication that wrote that Marina wasn't too bad to look at and that someone might be able to use her which is just disgusting. Like, great journalism, guys. Yeah, you really get a Pulitzer Prize for that bullshit. <laughs> okay. Also, this is one of the things that Marina showed in her performance. She was simply an object that would become whatever you, the audience member, perceive her to be. And then that would determine how you treat her. Whether you would wipe her tears away or cut off her clothes and hold a gun to her head, it speaks nothing to her and everything to you. She could be anyone, or she is no one but you will always be you, and once you come to realize that, you run away as fast as you possibly can, because nothing is scarier than having to truly face yourself. So let's move on to the internet. This experience shows us so much about internet culture and how it works now, the relationship between content creator and audience, the nature of online interactions. We can draw a lot of parallels here. See, Rhythm Zero is an example of a performance piece that violently escalated due to the participation of the viewers. And the audience acted as a group, as a collective, right? And were able to remain anonymous within the group. See, Mary Richards has written about how group psychology was at play here in this performance, right? According to her, a group acting out their desires is significantly more dangerous than a situation where the people would have had to face the artist alone. The individual is not responsible. The group itself is responsible. Group members will then encourage each other, you know, to push boundaries to test limits. She also says how Marina's passivity and refusal to take on any form of identity during the performance, this positioned her as the other. And in some ways, she became an outsider to the group. This is a dangerous, dangerous situation. You have individuals who, on their own, would never act this way, but together they encourage each other, and by having each other there, they become an us. Everyone not in the group becomes the other. Each non-violent individual has now become an anonymous member of a very violent group. Her self-objectification fully dehumanized her to audience members, and with each confirmation that there were no consequences, the brutality, sadism, and torture escalated. We see this behavior online constantly, right? With certain communities, certain cancellations, certain viral subjects, we know that no one would act the way they do online in real life. That's obvious. We know that. We've, we've been knowing that, okay? They would never say things to anybody's face that they would post on Twitter, but online you become part of that same kind of group, right? The community, the collective, they assume this anonymity within the group itself. And then at that point, there's no social responsibility and there's no consequences. Someone becoming a target of this collective online group hostility usually assumes a passive role like Marina. By posting your content online, you kind of assume responsibility or people think that you assume responsibility, right? By becoming an object on a screen, willingly, putting yourself in a position to be judged by the public, you kind of are assuming that responsibility, right? And then at that point, it's much easier to objectify and dehumanize someone on a screen. It's especially easy to, once their humanity has been called into question or publicly denied. And like with this art piece, you'll typically have subgroups that will step in as protectors. But regardless, with a victim who is perceived as being, you know, two-dimensional, not like a real person, you're not really thinking of them like a real person, and we see this a lot online as well, right? Regardless, with a victim who's, who has been dehumanized and who has been deemed now deserving of whatever the group eventually decides, because that's typically the case, which was the same with Marina. They saw her, they knew nothing about her, they didn't know who she was, and she was telling them, I'm an object, I'm, I'm up for you to judge, and they decided she deserved to die. Cruelty will escalate beyond what anyone would ever consider themselves individually capable of. If the target of this, like, online attack, right, does regain their value as a person somehow, their humanity, and this can occur simply by maybe it's just you becoming face-to-face -face with them and seeing them in a different context, because they were never any less human than you, me, anybody else in reality, right? But something that serves to rehumanize the victim is extremely uncomfortable to the group. This could be seeing them, you know, at Target buying 
Tylenol for their kid. This could be, maybe they come out with an apology that is really good and they have receipts to prove that people lied about them, right? Maybe there's that. Or maybe they do something to fix whatever they did wrong. It doesn't matter. Either way, whatever it is that serves to rehumanize that person is a very, very uncomfortable thing to the group. As a whole, the group may then switch to uplift and protect the performer, but more commonly, they may spread and run away like a grizzly bear is five feet away from all of them simultaneously at the same time. They have the ability to do these things because they've gained that anonymity from the group. Any person can then go join a new group, say the protective group, and that is now who they are, right? But the fact remains, the harm remains, the damage is already done. Whether you can face the fact that you acted that way, the victim had no choice but to endure your personal actions. Marina said that she still has scars from Rhythm Zero and that it was very difficult to get rid of that feeling of fear for an extremely long time. And I think a good example of this would be Eugenia Cooney because probably the worst case of mass bullying that I've ever seen is, is Eugenia Cooney. I feel so bad for her and we can see all of this with in her case. You know, we can see how she is view she's completely been dehumanized. She has people are thinking of her on a two-dimensional scale and it's just and they believe that she deserves to be kicked off the internet, right? She deserves to be banned. She deserves and then they are saying all these things that are escalating, you know, she's catering to fetishists or she's influencing eating disorders or or whatever. And you know, in my opinion, I think and this is kind of off topic and now I'm going into that, but I think with Eugenia Cooney, the only, she is not doing anything wrong, in my opinion. That's my opinion, you might disagree. That's my opinion. But personally, I think that Eugenia Cooney is not encouraging eating disorders. If anything, I mean, okay, I love Bella Hadid. I love her. I love her. I, I have nothing against her, but I am going to use her as an example right now. I think that people, young, young girls, look, or young guys too, young people looking at Bella Hadid, are going to be way more likely to look into disordered eating habits in order to look like Bella Hadid than they would to look like Eugenia Cooney. I would I would bet that most people would actually, if they are beginning an eating disorder or susceptible to developing one, I feel like it would definitely prevent that for them to see Eugenia Cooney and how, one, how she looks and but also the bullying that she goes through and the things that people say about her I I think you'd be hard pressed to find many people that would want to aspire to that where they have to deal with cruelty constantly the meanest things you've ever heard in your life like I don't think most people look at that I think they look at the glamorized lifestyles I think they look at the beautiful girls on TikTok who are dancing that are like super popular or whatever that are all thin I think they are and that's not a bad thing they are allowed to do that that's just a yeah that's I guess that's my point I don't know it just bothers me off topic again but there's only one video on YouTube that I think about Eugenia Cooney that is worth watching and it is by Of Herbs and Altars they are my favorite of all time, okay? But they made a video on Eugenia Cooney, and it is really, really, really good. And it's the only one that I think is not exploitative and stupid and mean. So I think everybody honestly should watch that video because they go into all of, you know, the truth about chronic eating disorders and that you can't just yell at somebody to stop being mentally ill and then they stop being mentally ill because that's not how mental illness works. Okay? I guess that's it. Hi, so I'm jumping in here really quick because I want to say, okay, I made a Patreon. Nobody has to subscribe to it. It's okay. But if you want to, let me tell you what I got there. So my FemBots video got demonetized, which is fine. I, I mean, it's, it's okay. I want to do more deep dives on things that are not advertiser friendly, right? Like I wanted to do a deep dive on cyber brothels. I wanted to do a deep dive on uh, a couple of more like risque topics or violent topics or graphic things things that uh youtube doesn't like as much so i wanted to do videos like that and i think the only way to do that would be to post them there so if you want to see like the deep dive on cyber brothels if you want to see that kind of stuff i'll have the link in the description it's just a wait list right now because i haven't obviously filmed anything and i'm not gonna charge anybody for anything i haven't even filmed but uh i have that on there i'll have that on there so you can do the wait list and then i'll also have a separate tier that is 
I mean, they're like the same price, but I'll have a separate tier that includes all of the chatbot stuff specifically as well. So it'll have both. But um, if you are interested in keeping up with like, say, updates with the replica situation or updates with other kinds of chatbots, I can do like different reviews of different things and smaller, shorter videos that are like less polished and less um, and kind of like as you go investigative updates. OK, I don't know if that makes sense. But like I found some stuff that might suggest what the new app would be and things like that so I wanted to go into all that but it's not enough to like make a whole video out of here so that's all gonna be there too if you want to be like regularly updated with small updates everything you know questionable things like we can talk about it like I don't know what's true and what's not like let's talk about it you know that kind of thing if you want that go there get on that wait list and I, I, have, I make no promises of when it will happen but it will happen thank you um, thank you so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. And I hope you'll stick around, subscribe, hang out, you know, whatever, and be safe out there.